Chapter 18 of All Roads Lead to Calvary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. All Roads Lead to Calvary by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 18 Her father met her at Waterloo. He had business in London, and they stayed on for a few days. Reading between the lines of his later letters, she had felt that all was not well with him. His old heart trouble had come back, and she noticed that he walked to meet her very slowly. It would be all right now that she had returned, he explained. He had been worrying himself about her. Mrs. Denton had died. She had left Joan her library, together with her wonderful collection of notebooks. She had brought them all up to date and indexed them. They would be invaluable to Francis when he started the new paper upon which they had determined. He was still in the hospital at Brigands, near to where his machine had been shot down. She had tried to get to him, but it would have met endless delays, and she had been anxious about her father. The Italian surgeons were very proud of him, he wrote. They had had him x-rayed before and after, and beyond a slight lameness which gave him, he thought, a touch of distinction, there was no flaw that the most careful scrutiny would be likely to detect. Any day now he expected to be discharged. Mary had married an old sweetheart. She had grown restless in the country with nothing to do, and at the suggestion of some friends, had gone to Bristol to help in a children's hospital, and there they had met once more. Neil Singleton, after serving two years in a cholera hospital at Baghdad, had died of the flu in Dover twenty-four hours after landing. Madge was in Palestine. She had been appointed secretary to a committee for the establishment of native schools. She expected to be there for some years, she wrote. The work was interesting and appealed to her. Flossie phoned her from Paddington Station the second day, and by luck she happened to be in. Flossie had just come up from Devonshire. Sam had got through, and she was on her way to meet him at Hull. She had heard of Joan's arrival in London from one of Carleton's illustrated dailies. She brought the paper with her. They had used the old photograph that once had adorned each week the Sunday Post. Joan hardly recognized herself in the serene, self-confident young woman who seemed to be looking down upon a world at her feet. The world was strong and cruel, she had discovered, and Joan's but small and weak. One had to pretend that one was not afraid of it. Flossie had joined every society she could hear of that was working for the League of Nations. Her hope was that it would get itself established before young Frank grew up. Not that I really believe it will, she confessed. A draw might have disgusted us all with fighting. As it is, half the world is dancing at victory balls, exhibiting captured guns on every village green, and hanging father's helmet above the mantelpiece, while the other half is nursing its revenge. Young Frank only cares for life because he is looking forward to one day driving a tank. I've made up my mind to burn Sam's uniform but I expect it will end in my wrapping it up in lavender and hiding it away in a drawer. And then there will be all the books and plays. No self-respecting heroine for the next ten years will dream of marrying anyone but a soldier. Joan laughed. Difficult to get anything else just at present, she said. It's the soldiers I'm looking to for help. I don't think the men who have been there will want their sons to go. It's the women I'm afraid of. Flossie caught sight of the clock and jumped up. Who was it said that woman would be the last thing man would civilize? She asked. It sounds like Meredith, suggested Joan. I am not quite sure. Well, he's wrong anyhow, retorted Flossie. It's no good our waiting for man. He is too much afraid of us to be of any real help to us. We shall have to do it ourselves. She gave Joan a hug and was gone. Phillips was still abroad with the Army of Occupation. 
he had tried to get out of it, but had not succeeded. He held it to be a gailer's work, and the sight of the starving populace was stirring in him a fierce anger. He would not put up again for Parliament. He was thinking of going back to his old work upon the Union. Parliament is played out, he had written her. Kings and aristocracies have served their purpose and have gone, and now the ruling classes, as they call themselves, must be content to hear the bell toll for them also. Parliament was never anything more than an instrument in their hands, and never can be. What happens? Once in every five years you wake the people up, tell them the time has come for them to exercise their heaven-ordained privilege of putting a cross against the names of some seven hundred gentlemen who have kindly expressed their willingness to rule over them. After that you send the people back to sleep, and for the next five years these seven hundred gentlemen, consulting no one but themselves, rule over the country as absolutely as ever a Caesar ruled over Rome. What sort of democracy is that? Even a labor government, supposing that in spite of the press, it did win through, what would be its fate? Separated from its base, imprisoned within those tradition-haunted walls, it would lose touch with the people, would become in its turn a mere oligarchy. If the people are ever to govern, they must keep their hand firmly upon the machine, not remain content with pulling a lever and then being shown the door. She had sent a note by messenger to Mary Stopperton to say she was coming. Mary had looked very fragile the last time she had seen her, just before leaving for France, and she had felt a fear. Mary had answered in her neat, thin, quivering writing, asking her to come early in the morning. Sometimes she was a little tired and had to lie down again. She had been waiting for Joan. She had a present for her. The morning promised to be fair, and she decided to walk by way of the embankment. The great river, with its deep, strong patience, had always been a friend to her. It was Sunday, and the city was still sleeping. The pale December sun rose above the mist as she reached the corner of Westminster Bridge, turning the river into silver and flooding the silent streets with a soft, white, tender light. The tower of Chelsea Church brought back to her remembrance of the wheezy old clergyman who had preached there that Sunday evening that now seemed so long ago, when her footsteps had first taken her that way by chance. Always she had intended making inquiries and discovering his name. Why had she never done so? It would surely have been easy. He was someone she had known as a child. She had become quite convinced of that. She could see his face close to hers, as if he had lifted her up in his arms and was smiling at her. But pride and power had looked out of his eyes then. It was earlier than the time she had fixed in her own mind, and pausing with her elbows resting on the granite parapet, she watched the ceaseless waters returning to the sea, bearing their burden of impurities. All roads lead to Calvary. It was curious how the words had dwelt with her, till gradually they had become a part of her creed. She remembered how at first they had seemed to her a threat, chilling her with fear. They had grown to be a promise, a hope held out to all. The road to Calvary. It was the road to life. By the giving up of self, we gained God. And suddenly a great peace came to her. One was not alone in the fight. God was with us, the great comrade. The evil and the cruelty all round her. She was no longer afraid of it. God was coming. Beyond the menace of the passing day, black with a war's foul aftermath of evil dreams and hatreds, she saw the breaking of the distant dawn. The devil should not always triumph. God was gathering his laborers. God was conquering. Unceasing through the ages, God's voice had crept round man, seeking entry. Through the long darkness of that dim beginning, when man knew no law but self, unceasing God had striven, until at last one, here and there, emerging from the brute, had heard, had listened to the voice of love and pity, and in that hour unknowing had built to God a temple in the wilderness. 
laborers together with god the mighty host of those who through the ages had heard the voice of god and had made answer the men and women in all lands who had made room in their hearts for god still nameless scattered unknown to one another still powerless as yet against the world's foul law of hate they should continue to increase and multiply until one day they should speak with god's voice and should be heard and a new world should be created god the tireless spirit of eternal creation the spirit of love what else was it that out of formlessness had shaped the spheres had planned the orbits of the suns the law of gravity we named it what was it but another name for love the yearning of like for like the calling to one another of the stars what else but love had made the worlds had gathered together the waters had fashioned the dry land the cohesion of elements so we explained it the clinging of like to like the brotherhood of the atoms god the eternal creator out of matter lifeless void he had moulded his worlds had ordered his endless firmament it was finished the greater task remained the universe of mind of soul out of man it should be created god and man and man and god made in like image fellow laborers together with one another together they should build it out of the senseless strife and discord above the chaos and the tumult should be heard the new command let there be love the striking of the old church clock recalled her to herself but she had only a few minutes walk before her mary had given up her church work it included the cleaning and she had found it beyond her failing strength but she still lived in the tiny cottage behind its long strip of garden the door yielded to joan's touch it was seldom fast closed and knowing mary's ways she entered without knocking and pushed it to behind her leaving it still ajar and as she did so it seemed to her that someone passing breathed upon her lips a little kiss and for a while she did not move then treading softly she looked into the room it welcomed her as always with its smile of cosy neatness the spotless curtains that were mary's pride the gay flowers in the window to which she had given children's names the few poor pieces of furniture polished with much loving labor the shining grate the foolish china dogs and the little china house between them on the mantelpiece the fire was burning brightly and the kettle was singing on the hob mary's work was finished she sat upright in her straight back chair before the table her eyes half closed it seemed so odd to see those little work-worn hands idle upon her lap jones present lay on the table near to her as if she had just folded it and placed it there the little cap and the fine robe of lawn as if for a king's child joan had never thought that death could be so beautiful it was as if some friend had looked in at the door and seeing her so tired had taken the work gently from her hands and had folded them upon her lap and she had yielded with a smile joan heard a faint rustle and looked up a woman had entered it was the girl she had met there on a christmas day a miss ensor joan had met her once or twice since then she was still in the chorus neither of them spoke for a few minutes i have been expecting every morning to find her gone said the girl i think she only waited to finish this she gently unfolded the fine lawn robe and they saw the delicate insertion and the wonderful embroidery i asked her once said the girl why she wasted so much work on them they were mostly only for poor people one never knows dearie she answered with that childish smile of hers it may be for a little christ they would not let less loving hands come near her her father had completed his business and both were glad to leave london she had a sense of something sinister foreboding casting its shadow on the sordid unclean streets the neglected buildings falling into disrepair 
a lurking savagery a half-veiled enmity seemed to be stealing among the people the town's mad lust for pleasure its fierce unjoyous laughter its desire ever to be in crowds as if afraid of itself its orgies of eating and drinking its animal-like indifference to the misery and death that lay but a little way beyond its own horizon she dared not remember history perhaps it would pass the long slow journey tried her father's strength and assuming an authority to which he yielded obedience tempered by grumbling joan sent him to bed and would not let him come down till christmas day the big square house was on the outskirts of the town where it was quiet and in the afternoon they walked in the garden sheltered behind its high brick wall he told her of what had been done at the works arthur's plan had succeeded it might not be the last word but at least it was on the road to the right end the men had been brought into it and shared the management and the disasters predicted had proved groundless you won't be able to indulge in all your mad schemes he laughed but there'll be enough to help on a few and you will be among friends arthur told me he had explained it to you and that you had agreed yes she answered it was the last time he came to see me in london and i could not help feeling a bit jealous he was doing things while i was writing and talking but i was glad he was in alway it will be known as the alway scheme new ways will date from it she had thought it time for him to return indoors but he pleaded for a visit to his beloved roses he prided himself on being always able to pick roses on christmas day this uh, young man of yours he asked what is he like oh uh, just a christian gentleman you will love him when you know him he laughed and this new journal of his he asked it's got to be published in london hasn't it she gave a slight start for in their letters to one another they had been discussing this very point no she answered it could be circulated just as well from say birmingham or manchester he was choosing his roses they held their petals wrapped tight round them trying to keep the cold from their brave hearts in the warmth they would open out and be gay until the end uh, not uh, liverpool he suggested <laughs> or even liverpool she laughed they looked at one another and then beyond the sheltering evergreens and the wide lawns to where the great square house seemed to be listening it's an ugly old thing he said no it isn't she contradicted it's simple and big and kind i always used to feel it disapproved of me i believe it has come to love me in its solemn old brick way it was built by kent in seventeen forty for your great-great-grandfather he explained he was regarding it more affectionately solid respectability was the dream then i think that's why i love it she said for its dear old-fashioned ways we will teach it the new dreams too it will be so shocked at first they dined in state in the great dining-room i was going to buy you a present he grumbled but you wouldn't let me get up i want to give you something quite expensive dad she said i've had my eye on it for years she slipped her hand in his i want you to give me that dream of yours that you built for my mother and that all went wrong they call it always folly and it makes me so mad i want to make it all come true may i try it was there that he came to her she stood beneath the withered trees beside the shattered fountain the sad-faced ghosts peeped out at her from the broken windows of the little silent houses she wondered later why she had not been surprised to see him but at the time it seemed to be in the order of things that she should look up and find him there she went to him with outstretched arms i'm so glad you've come she said 
i was just wanting you they sat on the stone step of the fountain where they were sheltered from the wind and she buttoned his long coat about him do you think you will go on doing it he asked with a laugh i am so afraid she answered gravely that i shall come to love you too much the home the children and you i shall have none left over there is an old hindu proverb he said that when a man and a woman love they dig a fountain down to god this poor little choked-up thing he said against which we are sitting it's for want of men and women drawing water of children dabbling their hands in it and making themselves all wet that it has run dry she took his hands in hers to keep them warm the nursing habit seemed to have taken root in her i see your argument she said the more i love you the deeper will be the fountain so that the more love i want to come to me the more i must love you don't you see it for yourself he demanded she broke into a little laugh perhaps you are right she admitted perhaps that is why he made us male and female to teach us to love a robin broke into a song of triumph he had seen the sad-faced ghosts steal silently away end of chapter eighteen end of all roads lead to calvary by jerome k jerome